Hello, everybody. Today, we are drawing animal anatomy. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't afford an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, and professional development. Here's what we're going to do for this stream. We're going to do the opposite way for the images. Jordan, you are going to start with the skeleton, and I'm going to start with the animal. Now, you've done this before. I've never done this before. So why don't you explain why you like to start with the skeleton? Uh, so for me, especially when it's some anatomy that I don't know, I think it's easier to understand what's happening underneath the skin. And it's sort of, uh, it's sort of, like drawing the figure you know we have all those exercises in art school where you start with uh the the skull and the skeleton and then you put the muscles on top and then you put skin on top it's the same kind of exercise and because i'm not familiar with horse anatomy to the same way as i am human anatomy i think it just makes sense i feel sort of silly that i've never done this before <laughs> really yeah, it's so smart. I, I think it's helpful for some sort of uh, for creature design. Sorry, guys, I just woke up. I'm going to slur my words. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I also don't think it has to be an exact replica of the anatomy. I think you just need to get kind of close um, when it comes to the bone, just have a decent understanding of it. But we'll see how far I get. I'm going to start off with just keeping it loose, though. Well, we do have two videos about how to draw a skull inside a portrait. And we have another one that is how to draw a figure with a skeleton. And so it's the exact same concept. And, and really, I think people get sometimes frustrated with these exercises because they worry a lot about the accuracy of it. But accuracy is not the point. It's going to look wonky no matter what you do. And I think what we're after here is to see where things line up. So say, look at the dog's leg and where is the joint? Because I think joints are critical with anatomy. Yeah, I agree. Joints are probably the key thing that I'm looking for. If you guys like see my drawing, these angles that I'm putting in, like right here and right here, those are joints that I'm trying to keep in mind. Uh, and it's one of the first things I'll put down because it's that essential. Because if you talk about the human figure, if you think about somebody's leg, your kneecap is incredibly important. And I think sometimes we draw the figure and we see a bump, but we don't know what the bump is. We don't know, is the bump a muscle? Is it the skeleton? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that you want to see. So it's not about getting the kneecap in the correct place, but it's just saying, hey, it's about here. And that's good enough. Yeah, that's something I tell my students whenever they're drawing just human anatomy. I'm like, what is this bump? Do you know what that bump is? And they're like, uh-uh. And so I tell them, <laughs> and I I give them some um, different pieces of advice depending on the situation. But I tell them all the time that they have to understand what it is they're drawing. Otherwise, they'll always get it wrong. Right. And that's kind of the importance of studying uh, the anatomy of whatever creature or human that you're, you're looking at. It's so vital. Absolutely. Well, because there's a lot of bumps <laughs> on lot of the bumps. anatomy. <laughs> lots and lots of bumps. So this is the dog I'm drawing. Isn't he hilarious? Oh my gosh! Look at his little ah. mustache. Ah. He's got a whole he's got a whole goatee going on. That's awesome. He looks like a little old man. <laughs> Well, and the reason my, I'm my drawing him, dog that he's back before. <laughs> the reason I'm drawing him is because he does such, have such a ridiculous amount of fur. But so this is a lesson to say, hey, you have to look past the fur 
and you have to start to really break it down structurally because the thing about all this structure is that you can't see any of it. It's all inside. And that's hard to do because it's usually pretty clear like, oh, here's the eye, here's the fur. But to think like what's inside, what's underneath that fur, that is the tricky thing. Manette is asking, where did these references come from? They came from this anatomy book, which of course, I don't know where I put it. The <laughs> name is in the YouTube video description below. So you can click on the Amazon link to see what the book is. And I got it at a flea market. So I wasn't even looking for it. It was like $10. Isn't that incredible? That is incredible. I think I might have found a PDF of a portion of this book before because these drawings of the bones and stuff, they look familiar to me. Right. I'm not going to do full out shading. Are you going to do all line, Jordan? Pretty much. You guys know me by now. Uh, you know, mm. it's not that I... <laughs> It's not that mm. I dislike doing anything else, but I find that I have the most accuracy when I just worry about line. It's like I have to shift my brain into thinking another way if I start mapping it out in terms of blocks of color or something. So it's just, it's like, it's what I imagine speaking a different language is like. I always speak English, so <laughs> I'm not sure if that's 100% accurate, but it's what I imagine. Well, so for me, I would much prefer do tone pretty much all the time. But if I do tone on this drawing, it's going to get too full and then I won't be able to add anything. So I'm going to do some line, maybe a touch of tone, but that's what I'm going to really focus on today. I probably should have downloaded this photo first. Um... Pat says, I love drawing birds, but I hate drawing feathers. I've been learning to simplify and highlight the major groupings and shapes. Well, in animal anatomy, there's oftentimes a lot of patterns, a billion feathers, all this fur. So Jordan, do you have any tips for how to deal with that? Because it is often really overwhelming to see all that stuff. Uh, my tip for drawing fur is probably the same as how I will discuss if you're drawing hair, uh, fur, hair, feathers, etc. You just want to put it into groups and uh, and not necessarily see every single feather, every strand of fur or hair at the same time, right? It, um, for example, Clara, your head is close to the camera right now, so we could see your hair a lot more clearly than, than mine. There's different lighting that's affecting it. But you're not seeing just, you're not counting one strand, two strand, three strand, four strand. Similarly, you will not see one feather, two feather, three feather, four. It will start to kind of group together. So I would just pick out those parts that are more specific to what it is that you're going for or what you want and, uh, and rely on that. And the key thing, don't think about individual hairs because that's when everything just breaks apart. And what you really want to be doing is seeing the hair as a mass. Depends on the person. I mean, obviously people have different types of hairstyles, but that's really what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. Although, yeah, isn't yeah. it kind of nice when you have a bald model? <laughs> Honestly, I find it kind of boring. You do? <laughs> yeah, my daughter's not much here. A little bit. <laughs> That's funny. I mean, yeah, it's, it, I mean, I'll, if I'm doing a quick figure study, like a two minute, then sure, that'll help. But sometimes it's kind of boring because uh, it's like, oh man, because there's so much character in the hair itself. And it's like, oh man, you've, you've robbed me of that privilege. Uh <laughs> unless it's like, unless it's like Walter White or something, in which case he, he, he his character just works for that. It's hard to get right, right. Well, he's got the glasses. It gives you little form, yeah. little structure. Yeah, he's got the little mole on his nose and all that. It works. It works. Exactly. I am the danger. <laughs> 
I'm still mad at you for not watching Better Call Saul. <laughs> I know you are. I know. I can live <laughs> we'll with that. work on it. Yeah. <laughs> Clementine says, I never bothered to learn how to draw skeletons because I was told using them would make the drawing stiff. So this is going to be a challenge. I think you can have your cake and eat it too. I think you can have structure to hold things up, but then you can have parts of the drawing where you just let it fly in terms of gesture. And really the skeleton is just a base. It's just there to help you think about, okay, what's, what's a bony part? Like the thigh up here, that is not bony. This is mostly muscle. Now, if we look at the joints though, the joints are really stiff because I think what's hard about it is people are either too geometric or they're too organic, but really the human figure and animals, they're both. Yeah, I think that's probably the biggest challenge is finding a way to merge those two ideas. And um, I, if you guys notice, my skeleton is super loose and quick. I almost drew it as if it was a gesture. And with that base, now I can kind of go in and be a little bit more tight when it comes to drawing this course. But um, but yeah, I, I would just I would just say take a deep breath and just figure out what makes it fun and uh, you know, use the same principles to make a loose skeleton or a loose gesture that you would in a figure drawing, you know, line of action and uh, S curves and C curves and all that stuff. Well, that's the thing. People think about the skeleton as such a rigid, stiff form, which it is, but you can draw it gesturally. You don't have to draw it all precise and straight. And the, the problem I think I have with the way people oftentimes teach anatomy is they talk so much about precision and making it right and getting all these areas exact. And I think that's actually a problem and it keeps people from just looking because they're so worried about making things precise that you sort of lose the big picture. Yeah, that happens to me. I mean, one of the big things that uh, art teachers, I know you said this before, Claire, to me, is uh, stand back from your canvas or zoom out on your drawing. I think that's probably the one of the biggest pieces of advice that you could pass on to a student because it's so essential. We usually get so caught up in all the details that we don't even realize that, uh, that we're preventing our own progress by being too close and too precious with it. Right. Yeah, I taught this collage workshop yesterday. We had such a good time. And I was telling a lot of people to do that because especially with collage, you just have so much stuff all over your surface. And it makes it so you, you just lose track of the bigger picture of the entire composition because you're all involved in the little pieces. And it's extraordinary. Sometimes I get back, I look at my stuff from a distance and I'm like, what? <laughs> There's like some major proportional thing that because you were so physically close to your drawing, you just can't see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys, you got to take a step back. You notice I haven't zoomed in one time. I've, I've actually been working on that for myself because I always zoom in on stuff. And I think it's one disorienting for you guys, but two, <laughs> um, it, it makes me a little slower when I do that. Nice do you picture. think there's such a thing as zooming in too often? Yeah, I do. Because um, I do it all the time. <laughs> yeah. And it and really, it just it, it keeps me from being focused oftentimes. And I'm not saying there's no good time to zoom in or, or get real close. But at the end of the day, you want the big picture to read. And when you're constantly so close to your thing, you, you won't be able to see it. It's like trying to judge uh, what a person looks like by based on a fingernail. It just doesn't make sense. So you would have to zoom out. You'd have to see what um, what all is happening there. You have to keep that in mind. Allison says, 
I learned how to draw skeletons gesturally by sketching in natural history museums. The time constraints of drawing on location helps me keep it loose. Oh, I need to do that because there is a natural history museum in Salt Lake City and I have not been since I moved here. And that that's a great idea. Sketching at museums is super fun and they have really nutty skeletons at these natural history museums. Have you been to one, Jordan? Not for sketching and if, uh, not for a long time. Um, I t the only museum, last time I went to a museum was the MoMA in San Francisco. That was like one of the only ones there. And it was, with all due respect, a waste of my time and money. <laughs> not your cup of tea. Oh my gosh. The, only, uh, the one thing I saw that was more of a novelty, I saw Duchamp's urinal. I thought that, 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 that was funny. Um, but, there's even, <laughs> but there's another one. There's another one. You actually know this image, Claire, because we used it for our prof when I first joined. Um, it's a picture of me holding, like, going like this, and it's a white canvas. It's a square canvas. There's nothing on it. That was at the MoMA. It, uh, it was just yeah, yeah. It was just up there. There was nothing on it. I was like, why is this here? I don't understand. I don't understand. Because, Jordan, it's all about the meaning of life. I can do better than that. <laughs> I could do way better than that. <laughs> Jane is saying, really wanted to do the collage workshop, but we had plans. What did you make? Well, the way I run the workshops is some people have projects that they want to work on in a situation where they can get critique in real time. Other people just want to mess around, which for collage is <laughs> perfect. And I say to people, listen, sometimes the workshop, oftentimes it's not about making a finished piece. It's about having a sandbox and getting that dialogue and that feedback and listening to everybody's conversations. Other people say, well, I need help getting started, in which case we provide a number of prompts. So I had a prompt where you do collage by ripping up an old artwork. I had one on visual journaling where the collage is about what is happening in your life that day. So we try to be flexible because people have very different things going on. Janice started an Afghan hound. Talk about hair. <laughs> yeah, Ariel and Anna were both in the collage workshop. And so Jane, if you want to see the work that they did, it is on the workshop page. So let me see, I can probably post that link for you because um, I closed registration. So it's um, not as easy to find on the website. Okay, there we go. So Jane, this is, let's see the collage. Oh, I can't type. Collage artworks here. Okay, so some of you can check out what's happening. Oh, you've done a lot of this, Jordan. Seven Angelic says, I find reptilian scales very challenging for that very reason, wanting to draw them all. So what, what do you do with a reptile? <laughs> <laughs> oh, honestly, I don't draw all the scales at all. What I do, I'll focus on the ones by the face, maybe the hands and the, the feet, the ones in the body. I just do something very sparse. So here, I'll, I'll do a quick demo. Like, it's, let's say, um, let's say it's like this. I don't have a lizard reference in front of me, but let's just say that that was it. It's the best lizard you've ever seen in your life. By the way, this is how my demos look in school and, and when I'm teaching sometimes, if I'm trying to move it very quickly, this is basically how it looks. <laughs> so in the face, in the face, I know that people are going to look there first, so I'll be a little bit more careful. And I basically do this kind of square, um, almost, or diamond shape. I won't draw every line completely. I'll just kind of get to be suggestive enough where uh, you can see what it is. And I'll make some bigger, some smaller, move them all over the place. I'll do that same thing in the hands, in the feet. 
but as I get to the body, I'll make it a little bit more sparse. I'll have some clusters that are really small, and then I'll space it out, and I'll go over here, and then I'll go over here. And all you really need is the illusion that this stuff, that their scales, you don't need to fill in every single one. Um, plus, it takes way too long to do all that stuff. So I think this shortens time. Um, and you just have to pick and choose which one there is. I actually have a video of me drawing a reptile on my Instagram and on my TikTok. And you can find the handle here if you are curious. I am now starting to add the skeleton. And there is an easy trap with a skeleton where you just go rib by rib, okay? But actually the individual ribs don't matter that much. It's more about the mass of the rib cage. Mm -hmm. And so I actually don't draw the individual ribs at first. I might draw, okay, the, there's sort of the curvature to them like that but I don't go in and I do all that individual stuff. So I do think drawing a skeleton has a lot to do with picking and choosing. I mean, is that just me or? I mean, look at the way I drew my skeleton. The, what you just described is basically how I did it is just yeah. mass. And there's no, I did not count how many ribs a horse has or anything like that. And, yeah. um, and sometimes I'm not going to say it's not necessary, but after a certain point, once you get the basics, you can kind of just guess the rest of it, especially if you want to yeah. stylize things. Um, and I have enough knowledge of human bone structure um, where it's not that much of a problem for me. Like I could look at a bone on a human and be like, oh, that's the tibia, that's the humerus, that's the ulna, whatever. So my dog is sitting in a big patch of grass and you actually can't really see his feet <laughs> very well. So I'm just gonna guess about where that is because I know there are bones in there and they're just not visible. Sometimes it'd be like that, just taking a guess. I actually think that makes it um, really helpful when you're able to use reference that uh, that is incomplete and then replace it with something else. So you can oh. build your own reference. Like I do that all the time. Like let's say a person's foot is cut off in a reference, then I'll find another pose that can work with it and I'll combine the two. Yeah. I know that's really hard when you have reference photos and you find them online. So often they're not complete figures. Like there's always something cut off. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that that's just the struggle being an artist sometimes. But in some ways, it's good because you you know you won't be taking from a reference verbatim. Yeah. But at the same time, when you're like, can be a struggle. And a lot of my students are like, I can't find reference of X, Y, and Z. So like certain types of figures are very difficult to find online. So I understand. Yeah. Well. I found two really good local models, everybody, and they're ready to go. And I found a photo studio and I really want to work with them and shoot a billion good <laughs> reference photos for you. But we need help sponsoring that video. So whoever can step in and provide the funds we need to make that happen, I, I'm there, everybody. I really want to do that for you. It's just, oh boy, renting the studio, paying the model, making time in my schedule to do that. Not easy. So whoever wants to step in, I mean, we have so much content on our site that would not be there if we didn't have these wonderful people that step in. So that is an option for our community to not spend time on ads <laughs> hmm. all right i think i'm gonna move on to the next animal here i've never drawn a cow before on the stream lisa says i got caught up drawing the cow and the background i need to start over to leave space for the skeleton yeah you'll notice that 
my dog has all these patches of color, but I left them out because I knew they were going to get in the way. So that is something that is important to do is to say, okay, I need to leave room so that I'm not cluttering it just for this particular exercise. Wow, this femur is so curvy. What the heck? <laughs> it's super curvy. I'm so in awe of that. Uh... Sometimes with this anatomy stuff, you're like, oh, I know what a dog looks like. And then you draw it, you're like, no, I don't know what a dog looks like. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I'm the same way. I'm the same. I completely understand that. I think it's tougher to draw things that we see normally, like everyday mm. life, like humans. Very difficult to draw because we're so used to seeing that. Um, because, like, one, it's just difficult. But two, uh, because we know exactly what it shouldn't look like, it creates a problem for people. Um, same with dogs. You know, we have domesticated dogs to such an extent where we're very used to them, but we also, if we're not drawing them enough, I think it could become a big challenge. Well, and also because you know what they look like so much, you build all these expectations. Mm -hmm. Of what you should expect from yourself, you mean? Yeah, because you know what a human face looks like. And oftentimes people will say to me, well, I know something's off, but I don't know what. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was, uh, I was doing a lecture a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about uh, how to draw various ages. And what the conversation came about uh, how Renaissance paintings and drawings would create babies. And they basically yeah. just created men's faces on like yeah. a baby or potato shape. It was hilarious. Like they just they just did not know what they were doing. Oh, so I know. Like they either it's not like they had photos. They either look like aliens or little old men. Yeah, it's very creepy. It's very very creepy. Can't blame them though. They didn't have photos so. Do? That's true. <laughs> they get somewhat of the pass. Hmm? Ariel says, I sponsored a video. It was a great experience. Thank you, Clara, for giving me an opportunity of being a bigger part of building education for everybody. Thank you, Ariel. That was such a gift to the community. Ariel sponsored the woodcut tutorial, which was so much fun for me to produce. And I think, I hope, is going to fill a gap online because I looked up printmaking videos because I just wanted to see what was out there. And all of the printmaking videos are like 10 minutes long. And I'm like, really? It is so much. To so they're not really tutorials. They're just giving you the surface of what printmaking is. You don't actually see the mechanics. You don't know the materials or how to do it. So I was very happy to put that out there and hopefully it's helping people because even in real life, if you're taking a printmaking class, like there's so many freaking steps. Yeah. When I was taking notes in my printmaking class, it was, it was like four or five pages of just information for one tutorial. It was really hard for me. I was challenged significantly <laughs> and it's hard because you need to pay attention to the tutorial that's i mean the demo that's being done but the thing is you're writing notes <laughs> it's hard yeah yeah i was not the biggest printmaker fan in that class I not was, your I was cup of tea <laughs> not my cup of tea not my cup of tea just like wet charcoal Although, admittedly, wet charcoal is easier to do, but still. It is. Not as much can go wrong. You just make a mess. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing for me. I don't like making messes. So I, I just Yeah, don't. I noticed that. I don't like getting, I don't like getting uh, charcoal in, in, underneath my fingernails for 14 days straight. <laughs> Mark is asking, 
I read somewhere that once a person knows how to draw a human figure, drawing anything else becomes super easy. Is this true? Uh, it can be. I think the human figure is the most difficult thing to draw. And so I think there's always going to be something challenging. But if you can draw the human figure well, you could probably assume that you can draw everything else well. Um, because like a robot, for example, or they, they tend to be made off of really basic shapes. You have spheres, you have cubes. That's the best cube you've ever seen in your life. Uh, you have pyramids, cylinders, and uh, what's the last one? Cones. So everything is made off of those basic five shapes and clearly the human figure. So if you can do the human figure in those five shapes, you can draw whatever you want. Okay, I'm going to disagree <laughs> because that's what we do really? here. <laughs> I'm going to argue that if you can do gesture drawings, uh, you're set, Cumberbatch, or I'm drawing a human figure. My approach to drawing all three of those things fundamentally is the same. Capture the whole thing, I'm, focus on the big shapes, look at the structure. So regardless of what I'm drawing, I apply that in every circumstance. And so, yes, you can get people who are really good at drawing the figure, but if they don't have a good foundation of gesture and structure, it may not translate because they have like their way of drawing the figure. So there is circumstances where drawing the figure for some people, it's almost like an isolated skill. And so oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, I'm good at drawing men, but I'm not good at drawing women. And I'm like, I don't think that's the problem. <laughs> I think it's observational. It's, it's much more to the very root of the problem because whether you're drawing a male or female, I mean, yeah, there's structural differences with the skeleton, but when it comes down to it, it's, it's your eye and looking. That's a big part of drawing. I gotta admit, part of that was cut out at the beginning for me. So I, oh, sorry. <laughs> I missed all the huge. I, I, heard, I heard Cumberbatch somewhere, and I was like, okay, yeah. she's going on about that. But so I missed whatever was in between that and the first thing you said. But I actually don't know if those uh, those things are completely isolated because, um, you know, what I said was you will probably have the ability to do it. Doesn't mean you will be able to do it right off the bat. <laughs> right, like, right. No, that's it's, true. It's one of those things where it's like, it's like, it, <sighs> Like if you're taking a route home and it happens to be the most long and complicated way to get home, doesn't necessarily mean that you have the inability to take the shorter cut or the shorter way, but you just might not <laughs> for some reason. Right, it's, it's right. Kind of, that's kind of how I see it. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't necessarily think we're disagreeing per se, but I also lost like twenty seconds. Sorry. I wanted a little. I wanted a little strife between the two of us. <laughs> Sorry, it's impossible. Mm. It's impossible. Clementine says, have you heard of the thing where they say every artist has to learn how to draw a horse at some point? Thoughts? Wait. Uh, no, I've never heard of that. Um, I think it's probably useful. Um, I do know of one artist in particular who just avoids horses altogether. And it's, it's really funny to see what artists avoid. I have my own as well, but I know like Jim Lee, the comic book artist, he avoids drawing feet whenever he can. He'll always block it up with debris or like put a big shadow or Batman's cape or something like that. It's hilarious. So there are some people like that. Pat is asking, do you think the human figure is harder because it's fundamentally difficult or because we know so well what it's supposed to look like. I think it's the latter. I think it's just people have so much baggage when it comes to drawing ourselves. I mean, it's kind of deep, <laughs> like drawing us. It's not the same mm -hmm. thing as drawing a pair. Like you mess up a pair, nobody cares. They're like, oh, that pair is mm -hmm. rotten, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, th I think it's both, honestly. Um, I would say more of the latter, but I think it's both because some people, when they draw an eye, they might draw it really, really flat. And that's not necessarily a complexity of like knowing what a human looks like. It's more of like you, you have a hard time 
drawing a round shape or a round object, <laughs> you know? So it's, uh, I think, I think it can be both depending on the circumstance. It might even vary per person. Oh question. yeah, for sure. Well, okay. I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant. Uh oh. <laughs> Sometimes I look up on YouTube because I want to get the right keywords into our video titles because that has a lot to do with how your video gets served by the algorithm. And all the time I see this concept, the bean. Have you seen this, Jordan? The bean, like when it comes to drawing the torso? Well, so what they say, if I do this, so basically the bean is this concept that this is the torso. So oh, they yeah, say, seen, okay, to draw the figure, there's this center line, you have to draw the bean, and then you, I mean, th this is what a lot of them look like. And the concept is not to draw like this, but to say, oh, this is the structure. This is how you have to start. And then you build. I'm like, dude, just draw a rib cage. Like, is it that hard <laughs> to go in and say, okay, just really simple. Here's the sternum. Because I understand the need to want to simplify things like that to me makes total sense, but it's like, why can't we do something that's actually anatomically correct? Like go in and God, I'm not doing a good job with this pelvis, <laughs> but anyway, so you say, okay, here's the spine. That's about the pelvis. And it's like, yeah, this is more complicated than the bean, but it's anatomically correct. And it's like, I will never understand why the bean is helpful because then it's like, you just have I think to redo it, things. I think it might come from animation on some level, uh, and simplification in that way. But, um, and, and I also think it's to help convey Squ uh, not necessarily squash and stretch, but one side with compression, one that's stretched. I think it's probably easier to see it on a bean shape, but I, I agree with you. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me to use something like that. I never learned that way, or at least I never found that way helpful. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I definitely get that. I don't know. And I, I just sort of feel like it's sort of insulting your student to say, Oh, rib cage and pelvis is too hard for you. You can't do it. You have to do this bean. Oh, I never thought of it that way. Interesting. Well, because, okay, let's say you draw the bean. Okay, fine. But then mm -hmm. at some point, you do have to get more specific. You can't stay with the bean the whole time. And then you right. start drawing the sternum. And then you start, it's like you might as well have just done that. <laughs> like I I I don't yeah. know. I just don't comprehend. I mean it's harder, it's a little harder. Drawing a bean is easy, but I, I just don't understand. I don't know. I've always I've always drawn when whenever I'm teaching, I've always drawn the rib cage like a vest. Like a like something that looks something along these lines. Mm -hmm. Like that just seems to be easier for people to comprehend on some level. And I don't think I'm necessarily uh whatchamacallit sacrificing any sort of integrity by doing that but i don't know but i don't know why people do things they do your vest is better because it has an indication of the sternum do you know what i mean and having the yeah. sternum is critical yeah that is true bean has no sternum fair enough i don't know I don't know. Sorry. I'm going to have to debate with some of these YouTube guys. <laughs> well, and of course, because our way is not fast and easy, people don't want to do it. So we have a smaller audience. <laughs> yeah, that's the unfortunate reality. People want us to be spoon-fed how to draw stuff. And 
I mean, some people can do a really good job with that and still teach well, but uh, sometimes you need a little bit more complexity for those more advanced people. And I guess it depends on the audience they're trying to reach. Some people are sure. more for beginner artists and some people are for more advanced and are taking it super seriously. Because like, if I was targeting seven-year-olds, I don't know if I would do the best. This oh way. no! I might do the. No, I might do the different. beat. You know, <laughs> right? So yeah. Right. So I guess it depends. I don't know what the audience that whatever you saw that channel was for. Oh, it was for, for like adults drawing. Oh, it was okay. I wonder. If yeah, I and there's guess. like I'm not going to do it live on the stream, but if I can guess. <laughs> okay, Jordan. My dog has no neck. Uh oh. <laughs> Whoops. Why not? I think I drew the skull too big. So now the skull is like on the surface. <laughs> Ta oh well. Maybe think maybe I should make the neck of my cow a little bit thicker. This oh, one's kind of challenging because it's, it's a it's a black it looks like a bull actually. But um it's all black and you've got super shiny hair. It's hard to see. It's hard to see. We gonna do our best though. Thank you, Goddess Wen, for the super sticker. We so appreciate your support. Those super stickers, they add up everybody and we need the income to keep the lights on. Thank you, Clementine, <laughs> for boosting my theory, who says the bead is basically a crutch for beginners because it's easier than no structure, but it's not going to get you anywhere because you're not actually learning how everything works. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name because of the language, but thank you so much for your super stick. I'm coming, everybody. Yes, Joe, relying on the bean, isn't relying on the bean, not developing the observational skill. Yeah, because the bean's not there. You can't observe the bean. <laughs> like sternum, the sternum is right here. You can see that on a person. Yeah, it's like the Spark Notes version of the human figure. It's just not, it's not going to take you very far. I mean, maybe it helps people understand it, but I don't, like, like I said, I personally never really used that. It never helped me. So here's a question from Ice Wizard I have trouble drawing males compared to females. Can you help me with female anatomy? Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of it has to do with the subtle differences that most people don't really think about so for example um the muscle mass in men tends to be in, uh higher than the muscle mass in women and so you'll see a lot of women like especially models like zendaya or something like that her neck looks really really thin and long it's not because women or or people like her necessarily have longer necks it's just because of the muscle mass versus if you look like look at someone like dwayne johnson his neck looks small and thick right so um sometimes guys don't even look like they have a neck half the time. So I think it really comes down to muscle mass differentiation and uh, and studying those really subtle things. We all know about the major key differences like genitalia and breasts and things like that. But look at those small details. I bet that that will help you. And also I would probably use rounder shapes too, just in general. For me, and, and this is a science thing, this is not me making this up but in general women tend to have a smaller rib cage compared to their pelvis so the width of a female figure's rib cage it's usually less than the width of their pelvis okay of course there's exceptions now on a male skeleton though the width of the rib cage and the width of the pelvis tend to be closer if not equal. So you could say, oh, women have a smaller rib cage, but it's not that it's smaller, it's smaller in comparison to their pelvis. And on men, it's a little bit more even. 
So that's what I always look for. Structurally, that can be very helpful. All right. Well, Lisa says, I think beans, boxes, et cetera, are helpful for some people. Minds just work differently. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if the ribcage thing is too much for you, do it. You know, I mean, do the bean. It's fine. I'm just saying from a learning point of view, like the big picture, it does create more work. That's not necessary because then when you get to the real stuff, you the bean doesn't help you that much I, mean, I guess it can get you going but um i think there's other ways to do that you, you know i just thought of a way we could compare it i think you know those um those games uh, those driving games for little kids where they have like a tiny steering wheel and you, you could put it like in the car seat or just put something on tv and you just have them driving like that it could help you understand the mechanics of driving on some level, but it's not going to help you get on the street and <laughs> start, you know, that's, that's not going to guide you in any way. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my dog has a tiny nub of a tail, so I'm just going to have to guess. Okay. Huh. I mean, I guess they look sort of like fingers <laughs> like fingers little digits yeah yeah rama nathan says each animal anatomy is different do we need to learn each of them to draw them um i would say you don't have to but you'll you'll notice that a lot of muscles on animals are very similar to each other. Like a lot of them will have a deltoid of some sort or a latissimus dorsi or something like that. And obviously there's gonna be differences because they're animals, um, but you, you'll, you'll see a lot of similarities. And so I think you can use that to your advantage. Like a couple of weeks ago, I was doing a centaur type of drawing and I had to combine human and horse anatomy, um, or actually for my drawing it was human and rhino anatomy but I was still able to take those principles. So if you understand like the keys, uh, the main keys for it, I think you should be able to apply it very simply or very easily. Well, and a lot of it is just knowing, oh, when I look at an animal or human, rib cage, pelvis, that's on everybody. So maybe you don't know the particular rib cage of a sloth. <laughs> but you know that there's something in there. So a lot of it is just being aware. Like I know, I mean, this is a funny pelvis, but I know that the pelvis always has this, here, I'll hold it up closer so you guys can see. But if you guys look at this, this is basically the iliac crest and every pelvis has an iliac crest. So you can know to look for that. So it's not so much that you need to know the specifics, but that you just need to know, oh, I should be looking for joints. I should be looking for cheekbone stuff. And that that's usually enough. I mean, I never drew a skeleton <laughs> on an animal. This is my first time. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. No, never. Yeah, I th yeah it really comes down to noticing i think i think that's the key thing of being an artist is you just have to recognize stuff for what it is and being able to point out um those similarities is so so key and it saves you a lot of time when you could discover stuff like that um and it helps you to become more self-driven i think yeah because again the accuracy thing is not important it's saying oh i know there's a rib cage and therefore there'll be these ribs that are rounder and I'll look for the direction of those ribs. I think there's a cow picture in there where you can see the ribs. Hmm. I mean, you probably had to do more because you've done so much character work. For me, drawing animals has never really been 
my main focus. But in retrospect, I'm like, dude, I should have done this a lot sooner. Uh, I mean, I ha I've never designed. No, no, I won't say never. It's very rare that I design a creature character. Uh, they're necessary, and uh, you know, they're going to appear in whatever projects I I create. But um, I wouldn't say I'm completely used to it just yet. I've just uh, right. Honestly, the same things I'm sharing with you guys about my tips are the same things I think of for myself. Like I'm looking, like for example, here, let's just pull this up since we're doing this. Here's the image of uh, cow muscles. I know we're not really doing muscles per se, but these muscles, like the ones in the neck, like, remind me of the sternocleidomastoid on a human. Like they're so similar. Yeah. Um, and then you have the, I guess the lats right here. Um, and then where's the, well, you know, you have the, the rib cage, very similar to humans. It's just a different direction and you have the scapula. So once you see those things, it kind of becomes the same um, on, on all of them. You just have to notice where the subtle differences are. That's the key. Mira says, I'm drawing for my second children's book. I see that I need basic art skills. I started the drawing basics track. Love it. Thanks. And what can you give me advice on to learn art more effectively? Well, it's great you're doing our drawing basics track. If people don't know what I'm talking about, our tracks are a sequence of video lessons and prompts, and you can do them at your own pace. We also have a channel in our Discord where you can hang out with other people doing the track. And it's really fun to do the tracks together because oftentimes people just don't know where to start. It's like, you can say, oh, I wanna get better at drawing the human figure, but it's like, oh man, there's so many resources. I don't know what to do. And so the tracks make it very easy. You go through the lessons, we provide all the resources, all the reference photos. So check out the tracks if you haven't taken a look. So Jordan, basic art skills, okay? What do you think they can do to make it more effective, they're learning. Um, I mean, my first thing is repetition. You guys know uh, the twenty five hundred challenge, and you guys saw Michael talk about it a couple days ago on the stream. Um, but that is honestly what helped me to get better with drawing. And every person that I can think of who has had success in their chosen field, whether it's music, sports, art, they believe in that principle. So do it as often as you can i personally like doing shorter studies like 15 20 minute studies as opposed to a bunch of seven hour studies because you get more done um and you i think if you like if you're trying to study human anatomy for example and this is my opinion if you're doing one drawing that's going to take you eight hours you're probably going to exist with those same mistakes the entire process Versus if you do a bunch of really quick ones, you'll get over it and you'll see like, oh, that's not how this looks. Oh, that's how it's supposed to be. And so that that kind of method always helped me out. Um, but uh, yeah, so I would say repetition and studying properly. A lot of it is logging the hours. Drawing really is almost a muscle memory thing. I mean, I haven't drawn <laughs> in a while. I'm really only drawing on the live streams now. I'm just too busy. I have so many things going on. But um, I agree with Jordan about just upping your productivity. Because sometimes people just, they're going so deep and so hard into one drawing. And it just ends up making you really precious about what you're doing, which I don't think is good. I think that's sort of a stressful way to draw. Mr. I'll just call you on. Anatomy is very important and interesting at the same time. Is it need to know thing? It has, uh... Yeah, anatomy is super important to know. If you're if you're trying to draw anything that resembles life whatsoever, meaning a human or an animal, if you don't know anatomy, you're you're going to significantly struggle because everything has something it's built off of, right? Like 
like the computers that we use, the cars that we drive, they aren't just what's on the outside, the, the, the dressing. There's a ton of stuff happening inside and you have to understand how that works. Like tires on a car aren't facing that way because it's just random. They're, they're there because there's an axle and there's a position that it needs to be in so your car can actually run smoothly. So you have to think of it that way um, and think about the reasoning behind why things look the way that they do. That said, though, if you want to be an abstract painter, don't bother. It's it's really not. I Fair mean, enough. unless you really are like, oh, th this will be so. If if you really think it's helpful, great. But there are definitely disciplines where I just don't think it's necessary, and an abstract painter would be one of them. So, it it's it's a personal choice. I mean, people just want to learn it sometimes because it's fun, but other people, it's like they feel pressure to learn it. And like, if you have no intention of painting a figure and you just want to paint abstractly, like don't. <laughs> that's a good point. And I, you know, that's something I tell my students too. Um, I have a character design class and one of the things I talk to them about is doing character sheets. For those who do not know, character sheets are basically references for how a character should look at all times. And there's an example of one character I give, his name is Huey Freeman, he's from the Boondocks. He does not smile ever. Yeah. And so like that's just part of his character. And so I tell them, if your character is one of those people that just does not smile, you'll never see them, then don't bother drawing them like that because it's just a waste of your time. Um, so, yeah. I really want to do this super grouchy cow. <laughs> He's so <laughs> rude looking. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the cow that i'm going to be oh, yeah. drawing i mean he's pissed what did you do to make him that mad clara i didn't do anything i was in the car <laughs> maybe he doesn't like cars maybe he's maybe maybe he just doesn't like it i mean that's one thing I do really love about Utah. I mean, I've seen so many animals here. Never saw animals when I was on the East Coast unless I was like at a farm. Yeah, LA is like that too. You don't see animals out and about unless it's a dog or a pigeon or a seagull if you're by the beach. One of my favorite places in Utah is Antelope Island and there are bison everywhere. Like, you'll just see herds of bison. It's the coolest thing. You should go name one Appa. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring you to Salt Lake City and you can do that. <laughs> yes, I would love to have my own Appa. Yes, I know you. He doesn't have to fly or anything. He doesn't have to fly. I just, I just need an Appa. We all need an Appa in our lives. Ram says, I'm fortunate to discover this community. You all are being wonderful. I recently joined. You can call me Ram. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> awesome. By the way, welcome. I love that our community is from everywhere. So how about everybody drop into the chat what country you're from? If you want, what city is also fun to hear about. But doesn't it just blow your mind that we have people watching us in Morocco, in the Netherlands? I've gotten emails from Nigeria. Isn't that just extraordinary? That's actually one of my favorite things about being at Art Prof is that uh, we have such a wide audience. Like I remember years ago, we would have people from Croatia and one person was like, I'm from Egypt. And one person was like, I'm from Malta. I'm from... <laughs> wherever i was like wow that is so incredible i never would have foreseen that and it's, it's no. so cool when that actually happens um because so, some of these places i can't even point to on the map um <laughs> and so it's like wow like realistically there's just some places i just are so um unlikely for me to hear that i just don't know and so to hear people that are actively invested in our community 
and being from places like that, I won't name which ones I'm talking about, but <laughs> but it's just really amazing to me. Well, I, I think what crystallized that for me is when I went to Portugal last year with Kat. Portugal's not a gigantic country. It's not like I went to Hong Kong or something like that, um, which is a huge city. And I had so many people contact me and say, I'm in Portugal. Oh my gosh, I want to meet up. And Kat and I met up with so many people. In fact, we shot these video shorts. We visited Christina Roto's studio. We visited Mariana Santos. And I met a lot of people who I'd never communicated with. They had never commented or anything. And they, they were like, oh my God. <laughs> It was the coolest thing. I really think if we showed up in any country, there would be at least two people from our community. That'd be sick. No. Wish I had more money to travel. One day, one day. I want to go there again go where portugal no to um well well not specifically to mammoth lakes again necessarily but i just want to travel more because we had such a blast didn't we oh yeah that was fun that was a fun trip maybe there was a lag i didn't hear you say mammoth lakes um, oh sorry <laughs> that's, awesome. that's okay um yeah mammoth lakes was fun Speaking of which, I need to edit the videos we shot because I shot one at Mammoth, uh, not Mammoth Lakes, at Bodie, the ghost town. Some of you may have seen the short of Jordan sketching props. And I also did one at Mono Lake. And they're in the can. I just need to edit them. And that's the part that takes forever. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I got... Um... A notification on my phone that said one of the photos is like nearing a year old or something i don't know how that's even possible considering our trip was in august but still <laughs> i was like oh uh, yeah i was like this is cool though this made me think that's about funny. that okay we have denmark philippines niagara falls india Nairobi, Canada, Denmark, Kentucky, India, Hawaii, Illinois, India, and Pennsylvania. I love seeing that, everybody. That's so cool. Isn't that an eclectic group? I feel warm and fuzzy inside. I know. Also, I'm very, nice also very hungry inside, but warm and fuzzy especially. Jordan, you gotta take care of yourself. Sorry. <laughs> the mom in me <laughs> has to bother yes, you about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I promise I'll eat something after. Good. I'll, I'll make pancakes or something. Look at how pissy he is. <laughs> oh, yeah. He just looks mad. He's super mad. Trisha says, now I want to draw a cow. I lived on a farm and not once wanted to draw one. <laughs> well, it's funny. Sometimes the things that are so ordinary to us. We just don't think about them in that way. I mean, I didn't grow up on a farm, so to me, I'm like, oh my god, cows! <laughs> I guess that's how I feel about dogs sometimes. Like, I never draw dogs, and now I'm drawing one. I'm like, huh, probably should have done this sooner. I think you should draw Ace. He's so funny. He's like a big... He, he looks like a black bathroom rug. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? he um he just got a haircut i promise you i didn't recognize this dog i was like 
why are you licking me? Why are you so friendly? Oh, I know who you are. Because because you guys see him, he's got the, like the big face and everything. He's got the hair all over, but he has none of that now. It's completely gone. And I was like, who is this creature? Who are you invading my home? I know we're going to get Buddy uh, Summer Cut at some point. And I, it should be pretty entertaining. <laughs> You know, my favorite thing about dogs is though, what? whenever they, um, whenever they have their tongue out, it just looks like they're smiling all the time. Like it's yeah, it does. Cool <laughs> my axolotl's like that. He just has a permanent smile. I also like elephants. I think elephants are oh, hilarious. They have really fun skin to draw. Their skin is fun to draw, and their sense of humor is great. Like, I saw a video of a, a woman who was wearing a hat, and this elephant just stole it, and it looked like he was eating it. And then, he, and then she's like, "Oh man!" And then, like ten seconds later, he just gave it back to her. He's like, "I'm just kidding." Let's see. We got a comment from Ari, president of an association of scientific and nature illustrators in Mexico. This video is excellent as a first approach to animal drawing veteran no medicine can we use it as a first reference material for our courses it would be an invaluable help so in terms of getting permission to use our content you'll need to email me because i need to find out what are the specifics of the situation so you can find my email on rprof.org and just click on contact and you'll see it there mark is asking can you show us a short demo of how to combine gesture and anatomy? Are you talking about skeleton and gesture? Because if you are, we have that. <laughs> Just type in Art Prof Skeleton into YouTube. You'll find it. I've had an axolotl for a long time, Crispy, because we used to go, my family, just go to the RISD Nature Lab because I taught there. Saturday morning. So sometimes I would bring my kids and my daughter, my older one, she loved the axolotls there and, and then decided she needed to get one. <laughs> and we didn't get one right away. And then the person at the nature lab said to me one day, oh, I know you're looking for an axolotl. Do you want to take GMO? GMO. He's a genetically modified organism. So his name is Gmo. And she said, well, he, he's in this tank with his brothers, Joshi and Lucifer. And apparently Joshi and Lucifer, they were chewing his arms. Like one got chewed off. It was like a little nub. And what's amazing about axolotls is they can regenerate their arms and so he regenerated that arm i mean it's really small it's not very big and so she said oh you can have gmo because he can't stay here oh my gosh i know that's that is that is quite the story yeah <laughs> Karasu is asking, how could these techniques apply to fantasy animals? I really want to learn how to draw dragons. So whenever you're drawing a fantasy creature, you have to find out what animals they're based off of. Um, so for example, dragons are based off of the way we view reptiles. They might be spikier, they're probably a lot bigger, um, and they breathe fire and all that stuff, but it's basically a lizard. And you could study it and see that it almost has the exact same anatomy. Centaurs are basically horses and men combined. You have the you know the upper torso of a man, and you have the body of a horse. And so once you start recognizing what they're based off of, um, it, it get, becomes really, really easy at the end of the day. And um, I would recommend looking at Terrell Whitlatch. Uh, she does a lot of stuff for Star Wars, um, and uh, yeah, she and and. Just focus on what they're based on. That's that's the easiest piece of advice I can give you. Well, and I see pretty often, Jordan, 
people who will say, well, I want to draw a dragon, but there's no dragon. So therefore I have to draw from someone else's illustration. And I think that's a big mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, especially if you're trying to create your own stuff, you don't want to just end up being a copycat. That's going to be hard. Now, if there's a certain creature that uh, only exists from because of one person, you can obviously still get inspiration from it, but you got to be careful. Like, like even Stitch, right? From Lilo and Stitch. I love Stitch. I think he's one of the best characters ever. But it's very clear he's based off of like a koala and a dog <laughs> to me. Right. You know? <laughs> so you just have to and and he's blue. And he's blue. And then they gave him extra arms and all that stuff. So yeah, just start studying creature designers and seeing what it is that they do. Um, it's really rewarding uh when you start understanding their techniques. I mean, if you want to draw a dragon, isn't that basically a lizard with bat wings? Pretty much. Pretty much. And they breathe fire, and they're really big. Yeah. Typically. Um, fun fact, did you know that uh, the term dinosaur was actually dragon up until like 1851? Really? Mm -hmm. I didn't know it's that. Like if you go... Yeah, like if you look in all these ancient writings and they say that they were fighting this dragon or whatever, they actually looked closer to what a what we would picture a dinosaur to look like. And dinosaur wasn't a word until the 1850s, so you'll just see them listed as that. Oh, how funny. Yeah. I mean, I don't have experience with creature design, but boy, there's a lot of research that goes into that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, actually, one movie that I know did a ton of research was Avatar, uh, James Cameron's movie. Because um, they're all based off something and they all look very fantastical, but... If you look really closely, you'll be like, oh, that looks like a such and such. And I'm not an animal expert. Of all my friends, I probably know the least about animals. Um, <laughs> than, compared to like, like I'm, I, I kind of stuck to the basics. I'm like, this is an elephant. This is a giraffe. This is a right, zebra right. or something. Um, but everyone else is like, did you know about the, like, you taught me cop capybara and I couldn't even get the name right for yeah. like, a year. So... <laughs> Or copy bar or whatever. I still see. I, I clearly still have issues with it. So yeah, I, I am not the animal whiz. Well, Ari says Jordan learning to draw only from photos means a disadvantage from drawing from. I'm gonna guess real life. Do you think that's true? Uh, I always recommend drawing from life if you can, um, but I don't have access to everything in my backyard. You know, like I can't just right. go walk outside and see a giraffe or a hippo or uh, a panther or a tiger, whatever. Like I just don't have access to that stuff. And so I think um, I think it's incredibly valuable to study from life if you can. Like Disney animators, whenever they had a, a character who was an animal they would all do life drawing sessions with that animal there like i think um what's this, what's the guy's name from jungle book um bagheera who's a panther they brought in panthers in disney and said we're gonna draw this like every day for like months and then lions they brought in lions when they were doing the lion king and stuff so super valuable but you gotta go with what you can unless you can f afford a private session with a lion in your living room i you know <laughs> i would stick, i would stick with a photo probably you guys, there's no shame in using a reference photo. There are so many people. I don't know where this comes from. There must be some YouTube video that everybody watched <laughs> that told them this. But <laughs> learning to draw from imagination, first of all, it's really hard. I don't know a lot of people who are that good at it. And why would you turn down visual information that's going to help you why would you say no to that just because you're like oh no 
if I was a really good artist, I could draw horses from my head. I mean, like, why would you do that? <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, like, let's put it like this. I've drawn the figure probably more than anything else in my life. I've gotten to a point where I'm pretty decent at it. I still need reference. And I've got the human figure memorized. I give half the lectures I give are memorized at this point, you know, and I still need to see what things look like because otherwise I'll end up drawing the same thing. I might make the same mistakes. I might miss something very subtle that makes someone different. Um, you know, cause like Clara, you and I are both humans, but yep. we look very different from each other in every single <laughs> yeah. way, right? From height to hair texture, to skin complexion, to nose shape, to yep. eye shape, everything <laughs> is different, <laughs> you know? And so you gotta have some sort of reference. Also, I find when you draw from memory, you miss out on a lot of specifics. And inevitably what happens is you end up with something that looks sort of generic. I mean, you, you've you been to the zoo before, right? To draw, Jordan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you ever gone to the zoo And you look at something, you're like, sorry, I think it cut out for a second. Um, it, it, it did. Sometimes, I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I think it was me. Um, but so sometimes I go, I'm like, that's so weird. Like, I didn't know bears had. And so when you draw from your memory, you don't have that information. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and quite honestly, like Claire said, there's no shame in it using a reference because there's no way you have everything memorized and most most people aren't like that like i don't i don't know where the idea comes from comes from that you can't use reference that's like that's like saying a writer has to have every word memorized and not use a dictionary it just doesn't make any yeah. sense you know or a chef has to have every recipe memorized before they can cook something it's like no you use something <laughs> get some help <laughs> as Absolutely. michael jordan would say stop get some help you know just you know drawing is hard as it is i need every advantage i can possibly get mm -hmm. well this is a great suggestion so karasu says you could also visit a zoo sanctuary or animal rescue that's open to the public Yes, do your research to make sure the animals are given proper care and enrichment. Because you know what I really like about seeing animals in real life? I like watching them move. Because it's one thing to look at a reference photo of an elephant. But when you see them in real life, you're like, dude, you guys are really slow, aren't you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Unless it's a stampede. <laughs> right, right. No, no, no. I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need stampedes in our lives. But yeah, some animals just move real slow. I ha, oh my goodness, I saw this funny the funniest clip. It was um I haven't seen the movie Zootopia, but I saw a clip of it, and it was, there's basically all animal characters, and there's a scene in there where the sloth is proposing to another sloth, and he's <laughs> like, and, he, and he's like, "Will you marry me?" Basically, and then she starts speaking. She's super slow. She's like, "No," <laughs> and everyone's like, "Oh, I was depressed," and she's like way oh my gosh <laughs> like, it, was just, it, was, it was so funny i was like that is that is amazing that's a great way to play that <laughs> lulu says aaron blaze says he likes to go to zoos and travel to africa for practice yeah in my dreams <laughs> i would love to go to africa and draw animals that's so cool that's that's a very big flex. I don't know if people realize that. That's a, that's a major flex. Yeah, I travel to Africa just to sketch, just to sketch the animals. That's so cool. Karasu's asking Jordan, what was the name of the Star Wars artist? Terrell Whitlatch. I can um I can type her Here. in the chat. Yeah, type it in. Okay, hopefully. I'll load it. Clementine says Jordan hasn't seen Zootopia. No, I have not. <laughs> Just leave it at that. 
So it's Terrell Whitlatch. Yeah. Matter of fact, I wonder if I could uh, search up her stuff and show it. Oh, by the way, guys, slightly off topic. For those of you guys who watched the Joe McFo show, I'm not doing a stream tonight. I'm too tired. So sorry, we'll continue another week. Yeah, this is this is her stuff. This is like a horse mixed with a seahorse mixed with. I don't even know what this <laughs> is. Um, I love it. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what this is here, but you can see that there's different stuff, different inspiration. Um, yeah, this is like a reptile fish thing. It's really cool. All right, everybody. I hope you will join us in our Discord right after this stream. Please meet in the post live streams stage channel. We have three April workshops that are running Watercolor Interpreting Nature, which is this Saturday, Jelly Plate Experiments and Drawing Cats. We still have spaces available in these workshops, so you can definitely register still. Watercolor is this Saturday, so if you want to register for that one, you'll have to get that in pretty soon. Please join our Patreon group. It's like an art party 24-7. You get support in a small group of artists. You get to share your art in weekly voice sessions with staff. And I provide lots of critiques and support in the Patreon group. I don't do that in the public channels. Art Prof has services, artist calls, portfolio critiques, statement editing, and personal art curriculums. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.